Welcome, my name is Natasha Sherman and I am your host. And this interview is a second half hour of an interview with Jack Barsky, who is an author, an IT specialist, and former sleeper agent of the KGB, who spied on the United States from 1978 to 88. Exposed after the Cold War, Barsky became a resource for the United States counterintelligence agencies and was allowed to remain in the United States. His autobiography, Deep Undercover, was published in 2017, and he's here today sharing his story. Welcome back, Jack. Glad to be back. <laughs> so let's fast forward. You're, you've, you, you've developed all these skills, including self-defense and including, you know, how to make drops, pick up drops, uh, all of the things that we imagine spies are taught, uh, except if we're watching James Bond movies. And uh, so uh, this is more information gathering. So you're sent to the United States, and we'll talk about your entry in a moment, but what was your mission? Well, the, the primary mission was, uh, at least for the first two years, that was explicit uh, to uh, acquire uh, genuine American documents. Yes. Get a job and start living like an ordinary American. Yes. Uh, the one thing I was never really told, but this is all something that I found, find out, found out by a research, the fact there were about 10 of us that were sent in this time frame, the fact that we were actually there was just as important as anything that we could actually deliver in terms of intelligence. And, and, and this was, we were sort of the insurance policy. You know, when, during the Cold War, there was, uh, there were a number of situations where the, um, the tensions were very high. There could have been a situation where all the diplomats were kicked out. Now, the diplomats, half of the Russian diplomats, Soviet diplomats were spies. Now, think about this. Uh, you have a diplomat uh, running an agent who is uh, an employee of the CIA, which happened. Now they're all gone. How do you get information now f from this person and, and, and get it transmitted? Illegals. So that, the, that was really... Sleeper really, agents. That's correct. And yeah. so I met actually one fellow who was also German, whose only task was to live in the U.S., I had some secondary wow. tasks, and that was to gather political intelligence. So, um, just a quick question. So, you believed in communism as a, 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 a philo philosophy and political point of view that this was the best thing for the planet, right? Well, the only thing. It was a... A scientific certainty that communism eventually would take over. This is this is what we were taught, and and this is what I believe. It sounded good. It it, it appeals to your romantic notion, you know, that uh, brothers of the world unite or pro sure. proletarians. Sure. Uh, and and it and on top of it, it, it was scientific. Uh, Marxism Leninism was taught as scientific Marxism-Leninism. It's about the e evolution of mankind and uh, mankind as a society. So again, that makes it easier mm. when you believe in your mission. But it, at some point you said uh, <laughs> the mission at some point became to get close to Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, Brzezinski. So yeah. isn't that a little naive? Like, oh, just get to well, the... <laughs> Yes. Th this has been overplayed in the media, and because I think there was a quote that uh, that came out of 60 Minutes, uh, Dzerzhinsky was an example given. Oh, what okay, they got it. What, what they wanted, uh, they, they uh, uh, pointed out a few institutions that they were interested in. Got it. One, one of them was Columbia University, the Institute of Foreign Relations, where Dzerzhinsky was a professor. Uh, there was another one, and they, they still they still exist. The Hudson Institute, a con conservative think tank, and then they were really obsessed with the Trilateral Commission. I I don't even know if they exist anymore. Uh, so the Brzezinski name somehow somebody picked it up, and it became an urban legend. Okay. <clears throat> so meanwhile, basically, 
They want to in American society. They want to know how people think. They yep. want uh, information that you could share. And I gather they also wanted you to send them names of people that you thought yes, maybe absolutely. they could employ in the service of the Soviet Union and the KGB. That's right. And so you're living this. Uh, and then the story of you came through Canada kind of as the you spent some time there as kind of a trial run. And one of the things that you talk about is they can teach you the language, they can teach you all kinds of things, but they can't <laughs> teach you the, the certain nuances, cultural nuances. So you tell this story about the beer bottle. So Yeah, that, that was the first time I, I actually had a beer in a restaurant that was in Canada. And for some reason in that restaurant, they served, they gave you the bottle and they said, well, can I have an opener? And the waiter looked at me funny, and then he grinned, and he went like this. And screwed it up, <laughs> yes. He thought I was fooling, you know, I was playing with him, right. playing with him. But these are <laughs> subtle things that if anyone was looking for them, would notice them. And it's like you but, said, you didn't know about tipping, uh, or uh, you talk about being in front of Bryant Park, and somebody comes out and he, says, smoke, smoke, and you reach out to share some cigarettes with him, and really he, right. he gets ticked off because he thinks you're messing with him, and really what he wants to do is sell you a joint. And that, that smoke, smoke response was based on me having lived in Moscow for two years. That's called, That was the cultural norm in, in Moscow. You could ask anybody on the street, any stranger, for a cigarette. So I thought he was asking. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's yeah. all these nuances. And I think also the, one of the trickiest things probably is humor uh, and uh, of another culture. But so you crossed the border, you came through, you destroyed your identity that you crossed into America with. You had a passport. <clears throat> And then uh, you described this whole situation where you tried to destroy a passport. It wasn't so easy to destroy. You finally had to cut it up in pieces because it wouldn't yep. burn. No, it doesn't burn. So then you came here and you had a new identity, and it's the identity you still have, uh, Jack right. Barsky. <clears throat> and it came from a cemetery where uh, right. a, a boy died at the age of 10. And you Correct. were given his identity. Right. So now you needed some kind of paper and some kind right. of job. And your first, one of the first jobs you got was as a bicycle messenger in New York. In Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, there was an interesting uh, fall down to the first rung of the social ladder from college professor to bike messenger. Yeah, but I think it must have been very educational because you could learn a lot about American society just from hanging out that way. Oh, First of all, I became a street urchin. You know, I, I developed elbows. In, in New York, you have to have them to get through. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, the other thing is, that, and this was uh, a, an accidental byproduct, but really important that the folks that I hung out with, uh, you know, I just listened a lot. Mm -hmm. And they didn't, they weren't really curious. And they couldn't, they, they, they weren't curious. They couldn't detect any problems in me or with me about my behavior. So I spent a good two years learning from these folks the messengers and and their supervisors what it how americans behave right. and i picked up a lot of sports and culture and all this stuff so later on when i was able, able to connect with more intelligent folks i had enough in background so i didn't have to go back to my 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 artificial backstory right yeah and so then you needed a social security number and right. you um, started out by getting a, a museum card or a library card. Yeah, I, uh, I, it started out with a membership uh, to the Museum of Natural History. Even a library card wasn't, even though in Moscow they thought, you know, it would be easy. You just go and, uh, and you get a card. No, they wanted proof of residence. And I stayed in a hotel. They wanted an electric bill. I didn't have an electric bill. So it took me like several months to figure out how to get an ID without having an ID. Wow. And the Museum of Natural History printed little plastic cards with your name and your address on it, if you, as a member, so great. And I used that to get, to get a library card. And, and, and the library card was usable uh, to acquire uh, a driver's license. 
Wow. And, wow. And you know and you know the driver's license you're home free except you can't travel abroad. So then uh, in order to get a social security number they were uh, they kind of questioned it you're 30 something years old and you don't have a social <clears throat> security number and you created this story about how you lived on a farm and you yeah, didn't yeah, need I, one. That Moscow knew they knew that uh, there were uh, two classes that were exempt exempt from social security in those days it was uh, um, employees of uh, religious uh, organizations mm -hmm. and farm workers so part of my backstory was that i worked on a farm in upstate new york so when i and i had to go for an interview this is the one thing i was really scared of uh but it, it went really well she just asked me how come you didn't have a social security card and said i didn't need one why not? Well, I was working on a farm. Okay, done. Wow. So the one thing you couldn't get, and we won't go into the details of why, but they're just, yep. you couldn't get a passport. And that was like one of the biggest pieces of your mission. So you had to then go to plan B. And this is where I think, right. you know, again, the long-term investment, because they were willing to drop plan A, now let's go to plan B get an education, go to school, uh, mingle in society, you know, right. cultural events, whatever. Again, just to connect with people that might be useful. Yes? Correct. And, you know, as it turns out, Plan B would have been reasonably successful had I stayed with them. You know, I got to a point where at one point the company that had it has its headquarters in in Princeton, who who I will not name right now, uh, but uh, I, I was an executive in that company and had access to a bunch of uh, uh, electric power plants. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you went to school <clears throat> and you got a degree in what was your major? IT? Computer systems. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, and the funny story is that um, you know here you are living <laughs> undercover. And uh, they tell you that you're going to be the valedictorian. Right, right. This, uh, I mean, it's it was so stupid. My, it, it's a combination of things. First of all, my uh, my ambition ran away with me. You know, I, I bragged at one point after the first semester I had all A's, and I I met this pretty girl and I wanted to impress her and said, "Look, it's all A's. I'm going to just ace the whole thing." shoot, now I was out in public having stated I'm going to ace the whole thing and I, by hook or by crook I was going to do it and I did. Uh, two of the grades I negotiated. Uh, one professor wanted to give me an A- minus, and I told him, look, you're messing up my perfect average. <laughs> but So the combination is now uh, the, the ambition, uh, bragging, and then cultural ignorance, the last vestige. The, the, we didn't have valedictorians in, in Germany. So you were a little so, nervous about being outed, but it oh, all you, you did become the valedictorian, and nobody found you out, and nobody exposed you. Nobody so I was want curious. To, about, what? Nobody was curious about the graduate who was ten years older than than the uh, the other than his uh, fellow uh, students, and who ate, who aced the program in three years. Yeah. Nobody. I, I don't get it. <laughs> I know. Well, a lot of people aren't curious, you know. Yeah, so I, I want to ask you a couple of quick questions about your state of mind. So one of them is, um, did you always feel like you were living a vigilant life? Was there, no. because I know you were getting messages and you were tr uh, encrypting, transcripting, doing drops, uh, but you didn't feel like you were always looking over your shoulder. Not at all. Uh, um, I o only... Uh, took uh, these types of measures, and I was cautious and careful before and during and after operations, uh, prior to turning on the radio and and you know receiving the transmission from the center and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I lived a normal life. I you can't live with that kind of tension for uh, it's going to kill you. So you just have to assume everything's fine. I I turn it, yeah, I turn it, absolutely. Fear is uh, the worst uh, thing right. that you can have in this kind of a situation. Paranoia will really destroy you. So I'm going to fast forward. You met Pen Penelope. Penelope is right. from Guyana. Um, 
you know, you're still married to Gerlinda, but not attached. You met your son, Matthias, but the, no real connection, because right. how does that happen once every two years? And uh, Penelope uh, got pregnant, and mm -hmm. she also mm -hmm. needed papers. Yeah, she was illegal. So here so you are. Th there's, a, there's another interesting thing that is not normally done. So this illegal made another person right. illegal. I ma married her. We applied for her green card. She got it based on my documentation. Uh, which is absolutely wild. So yeah, then, only in America. Yeah. So then uh, your daughter, Chelsea, is the moment Chelsea is born, it's like this opening of the heart and falling in love unconditionally for the first time in your life. It's not the moment when she was born. Uh, the moment when she was born was a bit <laughs> awkward for me because of, I knew that I ha now had responsible for this little helpless thing. Right. Which which then turned into a person. Right. With who then you know made goo goo eyes at me and uh, and and loved me and. And that's, I fell in love gradually, but it, when I, after a year and a half, I was, I was pretty much toast. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I interviewed this guy, Tony McAleer, who is um, a former white Aryan supremacist who ran a hate line in Vancouver. And um, he now is head of an organization called Life After Hate. And so they're called formers, these people who have, you know, turning their yep. life around. And he said the thing that kind of the chink in his armor broke at the birth of his daughter. And he said it's very uh -huh. common with girl children in these organizations. And at some point there was I a see. meeting in Ireland of formers, uh, IRA, Red Brigades, Mohajedin, Bloods, Crips, etc. And he said it's a very common story: the birth of a girl child. That kind oh, of this is this is this is very interesting. You bring that up because I'm thinking: would I have fallen in love with a boy the same way? I don't think so. Yeah, it's interesting. And he so. has a son after her, and so do you. You have Jesse, and you mm. love them. But there's something about he said that female little daughter energy that opened his heart. Absolutely. So it happened to you. And so now you're thinking, okay, I'm, I'm living this life. And you had a son. And um, then uh, you got recalled. So you see this signal that had been uh, agreed right. upon. There's right. a chalk mark, that be, a red it's, mark that says... It was a red dot, yeah. Time to come back. So the uh, pre-agreed arrangement was you were going to go to a uh, drop, pick up different papers, go to Canada, head back to right. Moscow. And you get exfiltrated out of Canada, that's correct. And so then you go to the drop, not really, again, you're conflicted, you go to the drop, there's nothing there. Now, the story is a little bit longer, but you're right. At the end, when I went to a drop, to just at, at minimum, I hadn't made a decision as to whether I was going to go, but I knew there was money to be uh, right. collected. So at minimum, I was going to collect the money. Right. But there was so nothing there. Then you're standing, and you still haven't totally decided, then you're standing on the subway platform, and somebody sidles up to you and said, if you don't return to Moscow, you're dead. That's pretty much a, uh, an almost verbatim qu quote. Yes, you okay, did say so that. Okay, so now you have to make a choice. So you... You know, again, I, I can't even imagine the conflict, but here you've got this daughter and you choose her. You are unwilling to leave. And uh, so, that's so, exactly how it eventually turned out, yes. So now Moscow needs to be appeased or told something because you could be dead. And so you came up with a story, which I think is brilliant. And at some point you say there were three things they, they were afraid of. AIDS, yeah. Jews, and Ronald Reagan, because they thought he might push the button. So it, you exactly came up right. with a story, and you wrote them and said, I have AIDS. Yeah, which is I did. totally brilliant. And you said, you know, I, this is the only place I may get treatment, but, uh, you know, right. basically, I'm done. And they clearly <clears throat> believed you because they went to get Linda, and they gave her all your right. monies that had right. been set aside. I and, asked them to. Um, so now you're living life like, okay, I'm and then, of course, the Soviet Union fell apart. And so now you're thinking, okay, I'm done. I'm going to just... I'm leave. done. Yeah. 
I'm sort of an orphan. I, I never, I will never be able to travel outside of the country. I wasn't going to apply for a passport again. I would just live, live my life out as a middle class American. Right. And then somebody who had lived in the, uh, an archivist who from the Soviet Union yep. had been gathering information over the years, over the years. And he left and he offered all his information to the Americans and they said, mm, no, we're, we don't think it's valid. And he offers it to British intelligence and they go, ooh la la, this is yeah. pretty good. <clears throat> and somewhere in all those documents, they see the name Jack Barsky. That is correct. And so they let the Americans know, and now the FBI knows about Jack Barsky. And they don't move quickly either because this is a slow process. They want information about information about information. Sure. And so they even bought the house next door to you and they lived did. next and door for a couple of years watching you. Uh, for, for some time, I don't know if it was a couple of years, all they knew was that I was an extremely well-trained agent and they knew that I had been in the U.S. for uh, at that time, it was um, like 18 years undetected. Right. So I so could have been active. So you're a valuable commodity. Possibly, yes. So, so that's why they took the time. At some point, you and Penelope are having an argument, and <laughs> you say to her, "Listen, I stayed in. I was a spy. I stayed in this country for you, for Chelsea. You know, and thinking yeah. like." She would, you know, th think that was great. And she immediately said, does that mean I'm now illegal? But meanwhile, exactly. the FBI hears this because they've bugged your house. So you're right. driving somewhere one day and they pull you over and they ask you if you're Jack Barsky. And your first question to them was, am I under arrest? And they said, no. I was curious about the second question. What took well, you so long? The second, the, yes, exactly. And I, I did say that. It's confirmed by Joe Riley, the, <clears throat> the fellow who detained me. The word arrest is inaccurate because I never was arrested. I was detained. Okay. Because they let me, they let me go at the end of the, the day. Let me go home. <clears throat> So why did you ask that question, what took you so long? Did you think at some point you were going to be caught? No, this, this is my uh, odd sense of humor. Got it. And, and my, uh, my desire to diffuse a tense situation. Good. I had a, I had a very similar thing one time uh, when I uh, uh, encountered a very hostile CEO and I answered the fellow with a joke, which backfired, by the way, as well. But the point is, I, you know, I, I, I don't like this tension. So I figured, right. you know, I, I, I want to say something funny, uh, you know, break the ice. Right. And there were there was a couple of smiles there. <laughs> right. I can imagine. So uh, mm. we're in the in the service of the amount of time we have left. Basically, you agreed to tell them everything and you had valuable mm -hmm. information to share with them. And as somebody someplace said, you know, well, you were a trained liar, but as you said, they could check everything, plus they did lie detector tests, etc. Right. And right. so what you provided for them was quite valuable. And right. as it turns out, you didn't have to go to jail. You uh, became an American, you were allowed to stay here legally. And the FBI agent is now a friend and godfather uh -huh. to your daughter. I just spoke to him on the phone yesterday. So what a wild story. <laughs> so you and Penelope got divorced, and right. then uh, you met your current wife, who is a born-again Christian, yep. and you found God. I did, indeed. And now you have a six-year-old daughter, and it's like starting she life all over again. Uh, and and it gets a little harder, but uh, I get another chance to. Uh, well, you, nobody ever gets it one hundred percent right, but I, I'm think I'm a much better parent today than I was ever before. That I could and, get, and that that is such a blessing to me. So my last question, or last one or two questions, um, any regrets? I. I can't answer the question in the affirmative because, you know, I maneuvered myself. I made mistakes and I hurt people. And in that respect, I'm very, very 
uh, regretful. But on the other hand, the decisions that I made were based on what I knew, who I was at the time, what I knew, and what I believed was the right thing to do. And uh, that, that's one of those things, uh, you can't take it back. It, it, I did not join the KGB to make money or to, uh, uh, you know, for, for personal gain. The adventure was part of it, but I thought I was serving a good cause. That turned out to be false. Long answer. No, it's a good answer. It's very clear. And um, so uh, <laughs> I have two more questions. I don't know if I have enough time. Biggest life lesson? <laughs> Love conquers all. Yay, I like that. And uh, so one of the things that, you know, to me, I look at all this spy stuff and it occurs like some colossal silliness at some point. We're watching you, you're watching us, we're watching you, watching us, watching them, watching, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. oh my God. And, you know, and we don't seem to be solving, mending, uh, creating new great things. So the one thing somebody asked you was what you saw as the biggest danger now, and you said cyber warfare. Uh, I, I, I'm... I st I'm sticking to this, yes, uh, because these weapons are extremely powerful, uh, and it has already happened that uh, the, the, the Russians did that uh, to, I think, Georgia at one point to pretty much uh, knock out the entire infrastructure. Imagine if, if this country didn't have the Internet for a week. We're it's, dead. <laughs> yeah. Right? You won't get your Amazon delivery. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, no. do you think there's hope for us? I'm praying, but uh, I'm getting more and more pessimistic. I think uh, I think man is not. I think man is, was not made to to survive on his own. We we are going just we're going further further uh, towards that cliff. Yeah, we don't I, seem I'm, to I'm learn. Our, a, we don't seem to learn our lessons. I'm not a pessimist by nature, but what I see here, and and I think the, the biggest problem we as people have is there's a German word. It's called Denkfaulheit. It, it's uh, it's a disease that killed more people than any other disease. It's it's, it's translated the the uh, unwillingness and inability to think. I love it. <laughs> Uh, Jack, we're at the end of our time. Thank you so, so much for being my guest, for sharing your story. I can't imagine anybody who wouldn't be fascinated by it, and I would uh, invite anybody and everybody to read the book. There are lessons to be learned, uh, but also it's just a very intriguing story, so thank you. Well, you're most welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us.